Hello, welcome to everyone. And welcome to Anasuya Basil, who is a good friend of mine. I've known for a few years at this point. And she is here to share her wisdom, which I'm so happy for, um, on midlife rites of passage. And uh, so Anasuya, before we start, I want to read your bio so people can get a sense of your background. Anasuya Basil is a midlife renewal health coach, a nutritionist, craniosacral therapist, and acupressurist who has worked with midlife clients for 25 years. She helps women stop worrying about aging, love their midlife bodies, and embrace their wisdom. She studied the art of cultivating community with John Young at the Eight Shields Institute and wild crafting ceremony with Sarah McLean Bicknell. She lived in ceremony rich meditation centers in Boston, India, and New York State in her 20s and 30s. I didn't know about the India connection. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I have that connection too. Going back a long way in my family and in my life. We should talk about that sometime. But anyway, um, yeah, so we're here to talk about midlife ritual and midlife in general and health in midlife. So we have many beautiful things that we're going to touch on. Um, but I think we could start with just what is midlife ritual for you? What does that mean to you? And why is that so important for you? It's interesting listening to my bio and, and hearing about, um, you know, loving your midlife body, which is so much to me about really taking care of yourself with nutrition and having a positive perspective. And the, the ritual part or the ceremonial part that I think is important is, is, you know, dovetails in with having a positive view of aging. Um, and it's so important because you know, as you go through midlife and you start to have some of the symptoms of your body aging, your body going through perimenopause, your, the life changes um, that happen because as your hormones change, your brain changes, your perspective changes, and that juggles your, your whole life around. As you go through these changes and things get all stirred up, um, there is a societal distaste for aging and for our very mortality, our natural mortality. We're gonna, we only have a certain lifespan and aging can remind us that, you know, at some point this is gonna end, we're all gonna, you know, shed this body. That's scary for a lot of people. But it, what is even scarier, I think, than death for many people is, this feeling in our modern society that as we age, as we get into midlife and we no longer have this springy youthful beauty or we no longer have this sort of power of, um, you know, that youthful attractiveness um, that we will not be taken seriously, we'll be ignored, we'll be passed over. Who's gonna love us? Who's gonna promote us? Who's gonna like, champion us if you know we're middle-aged women it's like a it's a group of people that get ignored that sometimes feel invisible and i think that comes from like that our society doesn't really have a respect for elders so what could be like this beautiful passage into elderhood where you're you can look forward to gaining societal respect and honoring and like whew, you know appreciating all that you've accomplished and attained in life no you get like you know ignored <laughs> and this is really scary for a lot of women and that creates a stress that exacerbates all the symptoms all the physical symptoms. So it can, in societies where elderhood is honored, symptoms of menopause are minimal. In societies where elderhood is not respected, all of our symptoms and our personal feeling of dread just get blown up. Hmm. And so 
the really finding ways to honor ourselves as midlife women to really appreciate and respect what is happening is is crucial to our health and it's not just crucial to our health it's just like it is a truth that we have had we arrive at midlife with now decades of experience and knowledge and skill and wisdom and if we just feel invisible if we feel like no one's really valuing us for it you can feel bitter you can feel resentful and it, it creates a block to really contributing to our community you know like these are things that are our community needs every member to contribute and if you just sort of allow yourself to like be invisible then you know not only are you missing out on the fullness and fulfillment of expression then your community is missing out too yeah absolutely and all of this as we've talked about you know complements so well the conversation also on the symposium that i had with vanessa nixon um where she talks about menopause as a spiritual initiation and so <clears throat> your perspectives seem so complementary and um your wisdom is so beautiful together <laughs> um right and i loved listening to her talk it was an amazing talk and everything that she said i'm like cheering her on and going right on this woman really has it and it, yeah it was just great to listen to her yeah absolutely um and so one of the things that um, we mentioned, you and I mentioned that, that you would like to cover um, is your sense of the stages of midlife. So <clears throat> Vanessa talked a lot about what menopause is, but I'm, I would love to hear your perspective on, yeah, what are these stages of midlife? I think it's really good to look at because so many women because of the negative associations we don't want to think of ourselves as midlife women until you know we're like the hot flashes come and it's like really in our in our face like okay here i am it's full-blown menopausal symptoms and okay i guess i'm a midlife woman but when i i studied traditional chinese medicine through studying acupressure i went to the acupressure institute i did a thousand hour program and then i was on their faculty for like roughly a decade and taught tongue and pulse assessment and um, the principles of traditional Chinese medicine as applied to the bodywork aspect because acupressure is using finger pressure, not needles, but the same principles apply. And one of the foundational texts is a text from a couple hundred years BC or BCE called the Yellow Emperor, the Canon of the Yellow Emperor. And in it, it states that women go through a, a new developmental stage every seven years. Oh, so wow. zero to seven, seven to 14, 14 to 21. So when I think about this in midlife, I really have to start at age 35, which a lot of 35 year olds will go like, no way, I am not in midlife, <laughs> I'm a young person. Mm -hmm. And I understand, you know, like you, you, you can pull out the one gray hair that pops in, you know, <laughs> at age 35. Um, but when I look back on it, I started to notice these changes in my mid 30s. Mm -hmm. And I started to notice that young, I was starting to work with interns in an in office situation who thought of me as their mom's age. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, wait a second, I'm 35. How, how, it was such a shock to me that mm -hmm. there was a, a completely adult looking person who thought I was the older generation. I was like, whoa. Wow. And that to me is like the beginning <laughs> of, of midlife. Um, but age 35 to 42 would be that first stage. And it's really a waning fertility stage for, for women and can be more difficult to get pregnant. Certainly women have plenty of babies in this, in this age, but it's not as easy as in you know age 21 to 28, which is considered like the height of your fertility, age 28 to 35, a little less. And then age 35 to 42 is, yeah, you sure you can still get pregnant, but it's less. And you start to notice things like a little bit less digestive ease. 
and so on. And then the next stage is age 42 to 49. And again, you still can get pregnant in that age, but <clears throat> much less likely. And so you're really thinking about like, what does it mean to you to have your fertility wane? That is a really significant thing, whether you have children or not, whether you want to have children or not. It's like you do notice it and it is like a, a meaningful passage. Um, and it's certainly in that age period, you often have symptoms of perimenopause, changes in menstrual, your menstrual cycle, maybe heavy bleeding, maybe um, lack of your period, maybe uh, hot flashes and night sweats, insomnia, more digestive issues and so on. And then you start really grappling with the, the issue of aging. And then age 49 to 56 would be an age where, you know, this whole issue around when your periods stop is going to get resolved in that age period because mostly by age 56 period, people of women have had a year without menstruation and are officially postmenopausal. And uh, so you're transitioning right into the postmenopausal phase. And uh, I do think that the other things come into play, changes in your relationships, changes in your job situation as your perspective is changing. And then I feel like age 56 to 63 is kind of like a very much of an integration of all that because at age 56, you've probably been postmenopausal a few years um, and you know, going into your early 60s. Um, you're really integrating all the changes and going and, and really seeing where you've come from and setting yourself up for an elderhood. And maybe you can even think of yourself as, you know, a baby elder in this period. And being an elder is often relative to who you're hanging out with. If you're hanging out with 20 and 30 years old people, yeah, they think of you as an elder. If you're hanging out with people in their 40s and 50s, they're like, no, you're not my elder. <laughs> you, know? you have to wait till you're in your 70s and 80s for that. So it's all relative. I felt in some ways that at post, as soon as I was postmenopausal, I felt in some way an elder because I felt so different, um, but I wasn't perceived that way by except the youngest people around me. Um, but yeah, I really feel like the beginning of, of elderhood is starting in this age. So that's how, what I think of as the span of midlife. And obviously it's not like set in stone or anything, but it's an interesting way to think of it. Beautiful. So when you're talking about midlife ritual, I mean, I'm curious. Yeah. Well, I have one other thing I want to oh. add, excuse yeah, me, Martha. Oh, yeah. Because I just want to say that in the yellow emperor, that they end everything at age 49 for women. <laughs> and they're like, you're done. And you know, no, <laughs> you know, you're wrinkling and you're all your energy goes away and you're, you're pretty much finished. Um, so like I've added my own interpretation onto that, continuing that seven years, because that's just obviously not true. We don't end our lives. We go on and on and so on. So maybe at that age, maybe at that's that, maybe in that era, life was much shorter <laughs> I maybe guess. i know there are records of people living into their 90s in that, yeah. in that era yeah. so yeah. i don't maybe know why I'll... they put it that way but that's what they did say <laughs> so that's another way thing that we're having to combat even like these ancient traditions of like have us all finished up at 49 and we're like wait a second we're just getting started <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. speaking for myself at age 45 <laughs> i'm definitely like launching into a whole new something <laughs> yeah um right so um was there anything else you wanted to talk about before we talk about midlife ritual itself um is there anything you feel like was important to touch on first i guess i just want to touch on um because i'm a nutritionist i just really have to say something about nourishing yourself yeah absolutely. Because, um back to traditional Chinese medicine, one of the main patterns is noticed in for midlife women is yin deficiency. And that's a deficiency in inner nourishment, a deficiency in moisture. You know, symptoms are the hot flashes and the night sweats and the dry skin and, and so on. And it's not like that you actually have too much heat. You don't 
if, or you have too much yang energy that's creating that heat, the symptoms of heat, what it really is, is a deficiency in moisture, a deficiency in coolness and a deficiency, a lack of inner nourishment. It's like, when you think of you know women having this inner well from which we act, and if that inner well gets depleted, like <laughs> it's very hard to give and you just, you feel cranky and bitter and resentful and it's like, <laughs> you know, you can't really do your creative expression when your inner well gets depleted. And I think all women know that feeling of like, I have nothing left to give, leave me alone. <laughs> oh, totally. you know, so it's like this piece about inner nourishment is one of the most crucial things in midlife. If you have been undernourishing yourself, it really shows up strongly in midlife and you have to figure out your ways of nourishing yourself like you've never done before. Mm. and you know as a nutritionist I do think about nutrition and one of the basic principles is thinking about for your individual body what are the foods that nourish you which are the nutrition heroes um, I like that you know calling it nutrition heroes instead of these are the things you should do but these are the heroes in terms of the foods that give us the most vitamins and minerals and enzymes and you know and so on that energize every cell in your body mm. so maybe it's raw sauerkraut because there's so many probiotics in raw sauerkraut maybe it's um, kale because of all the chlorophyll and the minerals in kale maybe it's a steak for someone who really needs the b12 and the iron of red meat that's grown well. You know, obviously if you have a vegetarian vegan diet that might not be right for you, but you know, for some people that is a nutrition hero. Um, and then in contrast, the nutrition bandits are um, foods that would deplete you. Uh, you know, the most common ones we all know are like sugar, right? Because when you, you only need like a teaspoon of glucose in your body to run your metabolism, but you know, you have one little dessert and you know that's more than one teaspoon of sugar in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have it and your body has to do all these metabolic gymnastics mm -hmm. in order to um, manage that excessive sugar. And those metabolic gymnastics use up your store of vitamins and minerals. So that food depletes you. And that's why they say, you know, after you have you know, some excessive sugar. I'm not talking about a teaspoon of honey in your tea or something like that. I'm, you know, I'm talking about really sugary desserts. After that, you, um, your whole immune system is depressed for a yeah. few hours until you can regain the, the nutrients your immune system needs to, you know, run proper defense and offense against pathogens and so on. So nutritional bandits are things that drain your energy, steal your nutrients from you. And one person's bandit might be another person's hero for like yogurt, for example, is a bandit for me because I can't digest that milk protein. Mm. And so if I have yogurt, I look like in my, I'm in my third trimester of pregnancy. I get so bloated, it's really uncomfortable and yogurt is a bandit for me. But for another person, that's a wonderful source of protein. That's a wonderful source of probiotics. And so you, you really have to zero in on your individual body in order to get the best nourishment and know the difference. And every spring I run a nutritional detox and I call it love your midlife body because we take six weeks and we, uh, we eliminate what might be our bandits. Um, we bring in lots of heroes and we really notice how it makes us feel. Mm. And some of us have never known you know, since we were a child, what our bodies feel like without running on caffeine. Like, mm. how does it feel? You know, because yeah. it's just such a habit, right? And um, you, know, you might say, well, it feels bad when I stop. But yeah, for the first week, it can feel bad and you decrease slowly. And, but then after that, you know, you, you have your energy coming from a more natural place within you and it feels different. Mm -hmm. So the elimination diet really helps you get back to your baseline to understand your body and the effect of different foods. And then you can reintroduce some things and then you notice the difference more. And by doing that exercise, you really start individualizing 
your nourishment for you, what works for you. And when you're a midlife woman, you can understand this much better than you ever did in your younger years. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have personal experience with a lot of all of that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so with regard to midlife ritual, what I know that you are actually offering a class um, regarding, or I mean, a, well, tell us more, <laughs> tell us what you're, you're actually about to offer and also just start the conversation about midlife ritual. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I feel like what you are about to offer is, you know, so tied into what you want to talk about in this conversation. So yeah, I'm so excited about this new class that I'm offering. I've been thinking about it for like a decade and it's going wow. on. Now I'm finally putting it together the way I want. It's, um, it's like summer school for midlife women. <laughs> it's six weeks, you know, from the end of June to the end of July. And, um, you know, we are having uh, ceremonial speaking circles to really bring up some of the T topics that are most relevant to our health and wellness as midlife women. And, and in our, we also talk about how to create um, uh, an intuitive ceremony to celebrate mm -hmm. where we've been, who we are now, and to have the feeling that we can really feel stand tall and feel really proud of ourselves as midlife women, instead of like, oh, I'm not as pretty as I used to be. Oh, I'm probably gonna get passed over for the promotion because all the younger people are coming up. And it's like, no, like we got to stand tall in ourselves and what we've accomplished as midlife women. And it has to like really be in our core and radiate out from there. Like we can't wait for society to approve of us, right? Like totally. we have the ability to stand tall in our power. And as midlife women, it's this is not like automatically done because human beings, it's like we use our mirror neurons to um, you know, take in what we're receiving. And if no one is, is saying anything positive about midlife and no one is recognizing your, your power or no one is recognizing what you've accomplished, like you don't recognize it yourself. It's just really, you have to be an unusual person to really do that for yourself. Like we all need people to mirror us, to really, it like it shifts something in your brain when you're well mirrored so that you go, oh, I really get it now. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'll even say to my, you know, I'll say, I'm proud of being a midlife woman. But when it, it's mirrored back to you, you're like, you, when you hear it, it shifts something in your brain and you really can incorporate it more clearly. Yeah. And I have come to realize that there certainly are a lot of challenges for being in being midlife and getting older. And when I've had ceremonial circles on the topic of the gifts of aging, we start with what are the challenges? Because let's not sweep it under the rug. We do have to address it. We're not going to get to the gifts of aging if we sweep our difficulties under the rug. So we, you know, we, we imagine a metaphorical pot and we put in all the things that are bugging us, you know, the achy joints, the night sweats, the you know, you know, fading beauty or whatever <laughs> you want to call it, you know, that really bother people. Um, and, you know, we get into it, you know, people have lots of things to contribute to that pot, right? Um, and then we switch and we talk about what are the gifts of aging? Mm -hmm. And the gifts of aging, people start talking about, I have really good boundaries now, and I'm not in toxic relationships anymore. I feel nice. so free. Nice. Yes. Yeah. That's a gift of aging. Huge. Or, you know, when I was younger, I just really discounted my artistic talent or my musical talent, and I never made time for it. Mm. I'm going back and I really don't care what people say now. I, it doesn't bother me if they critique my art. I'm like, well, whatever, you know, <laughs> good for you. I'm doing it. And yeah. you have this opportunity to go back to these previous gifts and talents that you didn't have time for, or you felt that you couldn't do for whatever reason, and you can do them. And you're like, you can do them probably with more depth than you could when you were yeah. younger. Absolutely. It's an amazing gift. Mm. 
And, you know, a, and a basic gift, I think every midlife woman starts to feel it is like, you just don't care so much what people think. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> just don't care. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There's something, the way our hormones affect our brains when we're reproductive age. I mean, having children requires so much of us mm. and we need community support. So we need people to like us. We need people to get along with us so that we're not out there alone trying to raise kids by ourselves. And we feel this whether we have kids or not because we're hormonally uh, wired this way. But when wow. our hormones shift, you, you just start to go, I just don't <laughs> uh, care. Yeah, I've never thought of that being a contributing factor to that phenomenon. That is fascinating. And you're right for, I could say for me, it, you know, once, I mean, my kids are age 10 and 15. So it was, I don't know, five-ish years ago. Once, once, I guess my daughter, my youngest was past, you know, preschool age where it's like, I needed so much help, especially as a single mom, you know, so, so reliant on like her preschool teachers and all that kind of thing. Yeah, it's somewhere around then when I started to make the shift into, eh, <laughs> yeah. I've like checked, I've checked all those societal boxes, like marriage done. <laughs> I mean, you know, and divorce, um, children done, uh, career done. Um, <clears throat> and now it's, you know, and I'm, obviously I'm still a mother and I'm still raising my children. And that's, you know, the top priority in my life, but, but yeah, now it's kind of the rules are off. <laughs> Yeah, it's and it's awesome. that isn't that a, f a freeing experience? Oh, so good! It's so great, it's so good. Yeah. So you you put those gifts, and there's many more gifts, you know. Mm -hmm. But you put those gifts, and you look at them, and and you, and you start going, okay, wrinkles. Well, all right. So I have creepy skin. So I get a little overweight. You know, in the face of that, you know, that liberation, that freedom, that ability to do stuff that you couldn't do before, like. Ooh, okay, it's worth it. Mm. It's a fair trade off. It doesn't <laughs> feel like a fair trade off if you don't experience the gifts, if you don't recognize the gifts. And, you know, when women don't talk about the gifts, then you don't really notice them in yourself. Mm, yeah. You don't like go, you know, click, that's it. I've got that now. Mm -hmm. But when you do go, ah, I have that, you start seeing it in more places in your life and going, yes. Nice. Um, and I think also you have the gift is like you can see patterns in life that you couldn't see before. Like our brains are working a little differently. Like the memorization ability you had, like when you were in school, college, you know, like all the facts you had to memorize for those exams that you promptly forgot, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't think we have the same capacity for just filling our brain with facts mm -hmm. and memorizing them. Like <laughs> it, they don't seem to work that way. However, your ability to see patterns and find meaning in those patterns and apply them to all these different situations makes your life feel incredibly rich. Yes. I, I just, I wouldn't trade that for the, you know, ability to, you know, memorize facts. I, it, it, it's harder to study a foreign language now, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but still being able to see patterns is really super beautiful and helpful and it allows you when you take a new course of study to like even study it in a deeper way yeah i'm actually that's helping me reflect and maybe i didn't realize this was even a pattern <laughs> for people in general but for me <clears throat> what has gone away ever since i was pregnant actually with my son so that's been now 16 years since well he's 15 almost 15 and a half right so however long that is since my pregnancy with him my short-term memory is gone and it never came back but what I've noticed over the past few years and it's even getting stronger and stronger and stronger is when I want when I feel called to dive into a new area of exploration or knowledge or even I don't know learning music or whatever it is suddenly things just like click for me so fast it just all integrates so quickly um and it just goes, whew, you know, just like maybe because we have, we've already had, you know, for me, 45 years of experience of life and for other people, whatever, however many years we had, it's like, we have all these places that our experience can kind of 
tap into or something and and the connections just become exponentially faster i don't know I've, i have never actually thought about it in this way yeah i think that's true it's really beautiful and i also think you know yourself and you know how you learn and you know yes. how you can take in a topic and you know like any type of learning there is a part where it's frustrating right because you have to change <laughs> there's a like a comfort zone that you have to step out of it in order to learn something new and incorporate it and it's like you can have perspective and go well, that's not going to throw me okay yeah it's uncomfortable but i'm learning you know and you you ride that because you know it's worth it whereas mm -hmm. when you're younger like oh what was me i'm feeling so uncomfortable <laughs> with this learning and it like that's how i was you know and yeah. it just is like really threw me um but as an older person that steadiness keeps and perspective and knowing my own pattern of learning keeps me going yeah. and I, I just love how like i think with for myself in nature connection i mean i used to always love studying nature and learning the names of plants and birds and so on but now when I study nature, I'm like, um, just really seeing the interconnection and the interweaving of the different um, elements in the ecology and the, the um, underpinning life force that's connecting them all and how it connects with me. And, yes. you know, I feel the tree roots underneath the building is supporting yeah. me. I mean, I just, I feel so held in nature that makes learning about it like, exponentially yeah. richer experience same same yeah and it's that's reminding me of your your connection with birds which is a whole different topic but i <laughs> i just have to throw in there i love 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 watching you with birds yeah <laughs> um yes but yes <laughs> i totally feel all of what you just said yeah <clears throat> and and this is all just to back up into like why have a a ritual in midlife it's because, you know, I think it's natural as human beings. Studying nature has helped me understand like humans are part of nature. Studying nature has helped me realize like that my ancestors lived in nature and, you know, the human brain evolved in nature. And ritual is not just some funky people thing that people did in other cultures or some funky thing that the ignorant ancestors did but it's um, intrinsic to our, our natural way as human beings. Mm -hmm. And to mark a stage in life um, with a ceremony, I mean, certainly we know about graduations and weddings and you know, baptisms and things like that. But in our mar modern society, we kind of you know, make light of anything else. We don't really have <laughs> You know, someone said to me, after my wedding, what do I get until my funeral? You know? So yes. you know, our modern society is not great around ritual and, um, you know, giving people kudos for what they've struggled through, what they've accomplished and supporting them in moving forward. And, you know, so many of our ancestral traditions have been lost. Mm -hmm. um, but I really believe in intuitive ceremony making like, okay, so our modern society is deficient in so many ways, does not support us in so many ways, but we as human beings have it within us, deep in our DNA, we're still connected with our ancestors. We can figure it out and we can make a ceremony that is every bit as powerful. And there are so many different parts of midlife. So it's not like you have a create a midlife rite of passage that's like, okay, now you're in midlife or now you're you know through menopause and you can certainly do those but um like a really interesting question that i've asked in in a ceremonial circle is if you were to celebrate a rite of passage for yourself now you know if you were to do a ceremony that honored the struggles that you've overcome and you know where you are now set you on a good path going forward what would you celebrate what are you releasing what new understanding are you are you strong in now and it's like <laughs> there's so many stages where you you come to a new place and a simple ceremony can really help you grasp that and understand that mm -hmm. and again to like help us 
overcome, you know, to help us to create our own culture, our own little subcultures that are positive about who we are and where we are. I think it does make us feel, you know, when you feel honored, you're like, okay, I have to, I'm, I'm going to stand tall. I'm going to live up to these good qualities that I'm being honored for. Um, and it also invites in energy. So if you've been stuck at all, feeling like, oh, I'm not quite getting it. I've been struggling with this life change. I'm not quite getting it, you know, to do some contemplation around that, which this class provides. Um, and then figure out a simple ceremony to honor that change that invites energy. It's like you're inviting energy to say, yes, you know, let's get through some of the stuckness and like synchronistic things happen. I, when I was going through a divorce, it was awful, it was horrible. And I was like, when I get through this, uh, I'm gonna have a party <laughs> because this is so miserable. And uh, finally, you know, that sensation of you're in a dark tunnel and you just have to put one step in front of the other. And finally, there's a sense of like, oh, there's a little light. There's a little light. Okay, now I can, I'm going to have a party. And people, I invited anybody who helped me in any way, whether it was like they, they listened well for one conversation or they were there in much more in-depth ways as I struggled through this. And um, you know, we had lovely food and music and I love French, real French champagne. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, a little ceremonial French champagne. And then they all put on a, they gave me blessings. We all sat in a circle and they, one by one, they strung a bead on a, on a necklace and gave me a blessing for my new stage in life. And, um, it was really a beautiful thing, but the, I had the, you know, when you go through a divorce, the, the, all the papers go to the court and then the court has to, you know, send you the stamp and until you're officially divorced. And, and I, then it would also give me my official new last name. I made my middle name, my last name, Basil was my middle name, <laughs> not my last name. And, um, I just like so sick of waiting around for them. So I was like, I'm having the ceremony, no matter what, I finally get the papers. And it was stamped the day of the ceremony. Wow. But it was like, I really feel like these ceremonies, it's like you, you are really saying something to the, to the universe and the universe responds. Mm. And not only that, it was the next day I went on a date with a really lovely man. We had a wonderful seven year relationship and, you know, <laughs> I don't know, that was a really miraculous thing in itself. Wow. Yeah. Well, you, you and I, I'm just thinking back three, three years ago, were at a retreat together and you led a ceremony, which was so incredibly beautiful and profound. And um, I mean, I'll never forget it. It was like, I saw the, you, the, I want to say the, <laughs> how do I put it? Um, the spiritual leader that is you it's just like it just came through so powerfully and so strongly and you held the container in this way that it was powerful yet humble and <clears throat> i mean i'm gonna cry right is like it allowed each of us in the circle to truly speak as our soul that's how i experienced it um so there was like, like each of us just kind of automatically something in the way that you held the container, it felt to me like each person just dropped their sort of ego self. I mean, the, the part of the, any sense of needing to seem like anything, you know, it was just the pure truth and wisdom that needed to come through each person just did. And it was, uh, yeah, blew me away. And, you know, I won't go into the details, but, but for me also after that ceremony, I had the most bizarre, <laughs> um, synchronistic life-changing event three days later. And it was clearly as a result of what we did there, you know? <clears throat> so yeah, that's Wonderful. part of why. Thank you for I, that memory. 
Yeah. I, I remember it too. I do remember it was a really powerful ceremony that we did. Yeah. And it was a, you know, a, a ceremonial council. Yeah. And uh, I love, you know, the ceremonial councils. I did council training with the, the Ojai Foundation several years ago and I, just completely taken with it. And um, when I'm teaching this class, it's not the midlife rites of passage class. It's not a lecture class. It's all ceremonial council so that we're really hearing each other's wisdom and creating, co-creating this experience together. And I mean, I have absolute confidence that what is in women, uh, what is in the, whoever is going to be signing up for it is like so valuable and so precious and so wise, and mm. it's going to come up and people are going to hear it and people are going to, you know, feel it. And in that ceremonial uh, setting, you know, things have a, like a, a real deep, profound resonance. And I think people will really get like, oh, I do have some wisdom. Oh, I see how that person's wisdom is working. So therefore I'm going to see it in myself. Yeah. You know, I, I, I just know it's going to be both fun and amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, just to reflect on one of the reasons I asked you to be on this symposium and one of the things I appreciate about you is that you do hold the ceremonial space in this way, or just in general, I feel this from you is the sense of you're clear about your own value and your own wisdom, but at the, and at the same time, <clears throat> you hold space in a non-hierarchical way. That's how it comes across to me. So that there's no sense that you know more or anyone is better than anybody. It's, it's, we're all, this, these are my words. You can, you can, <laughs> you can correct me, but we're all spirit and we all have equal wisdom coming through us um just you know part as part of whatever is like the creation of that ceremony that circle that gathering whatever it is 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 a whole entity in and of itself you know and we're each bringing ourselves as part of it um yeah yeah i mean i truly believe that you know that other people's wisdom is just as interesting if not more interesting than mine yeah. And I very much want to hear it. And a ceremony is also an offering to the universe, to yeah. the, you know, spirit and, and the universe listens and responds. Beautiful. Wonderful. <clears throat> so one question coming up for me is with midlife ritual, is there, um, I mean, both in general, and then also with regard to the class you're offering specifically, um, are there some examples of times that you could, you've sort of touched on some of this, but are there examples of times you could imagine holding a ritual? Like when you talked about the different stages of midlife, I'm just, I can think of some kind of key moments, but I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts. Yeah. And I'm thinking specifically, you know, rites of passage. Um, how, I mean, I think there could be, a rite of passage for really recognizing my days of fertility are over. Mm. I did or did not have children, but it's a done deal and I'm letting go of that. And now what am I stepping into? Mm. Or it could be a rite of passage where you go, you know, this relationship has ended or my experience in my relationship has ended because maybe they have an illness. Mm. Um, and I'm now I'm a caretaker rather than the way the kind of partner I was before. Yeah. Or um, maybe I lost a family member. I, I maybe I lost a, a sibling, and I, you know, there's something I have to let go of. And now, who am I in the world, in relationship to that person who passed away? Now that they're on the ethereal plane and I'm here on the physical plane, like, where is that going forward? And who am I? holding the memory and holding what I learned from being with them and still being in this physical plane. Uh, it could be a, a rite of passage for saying, um, yeah, I'm getting, I'm letting go of my toxic habits. Like I've had some, you know, maybe there's some people have had some habits that I've worked with, with alcohol and they had very unhealthy relationships with alcohol and like, okay, I'm having a ritual to just really stand tall and like, in my relationship with, you know, other, you know, destructive habits. 
-hmm. and who am I now and where am I going? Like, I think these are the, some of the questions that will come out out of the ceremonial circle so that, um, you know, in the last uh, meeting, we'll do, we'll do an actual ceremony to, to do this. I, I, I did a ceremony with someone who had always felt like they didn't matter that much in their family, that everything that they did artistically and with healing work, their family thought it was stupid, thought mm -hmm. it was never going to make enough money that, you know, uh, you know, and, and they just felt bad about themselves. And so they got to a place of like, okay, I'm letting go of that. And I'm standing tall <laughs> in what I believe about myself and in my work and in my value in the world going mm. forward. And it, it was like, the, you know, the air was shimmering as that person mm. uh, read out this midlife manifesto that they wrote and that people in my, my program will write. Mm. You know, the air was shimmering and the, she had a, actually had a family member there witnessing her. Um, mm. And she ended, after the ceremony, she ended up in, you know, doing amazing things in her artistic and healing practices so mm. that's beautiful it's also going to make me cry <laughs> it's amazing <clears throat> i just want to say something i feel like i want to just you know how you go through difficulties in life and then the challenge you, you struggle with the challenge and you make some kind of gift out of it right I always felt like I was invisible in my childhood, you know, and I think I have like an insight into what invisibility does to us and how I've struggled with it. And um, I really feel like this is a class of like, okay, let's not make midlife visible and what that visibly, visible, visibility does to our brain and how we feel about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like, so that is my example of how that, um, I'll, you know, the alchemy that happens with age, yeah. you make your difficulties of your past into treasures and it might take 30 years, it might take 50 years, it might take five years, but mm. when you're engaged in your personal growth, it does happen. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah, it's making me think about, uh, both of my kids are very into performing, you know, like singing and theater and stuff. And so I've obviously attended a, a lot of these kid performances. And the thing that always gets to me for some reason, it, well, I want to say it's when the girls are singing a solo. It's really probably any, almost any kid singing a solo of any gender, but something about like, a, especially a preteen teen girl getting up and just being fully herself and, you know, singing the song, um, like I could just break down crying <laughs> just by watching that. And <laughs> so I noticed how important it is for us to be giving that attention and that validation to these girls. And then I'm thinking of you with these rites of passage and these ceremonies, it's a, a similar kind of attention, but for us, in any stage of our life, right? We don't tend to get that. People don't tend to get that in general. I mean, you're not typically up on stage singing a song <laughs> in front of hundreds of people or whatever. Um, but there's something that is so supportive, literally supportive of, of humans when we give that kind of attention and that kind of just like direct love, you know, just a, a group of people directing love and support at one person something yeah, in that and, yeah. and when you're hearing that teenager saying don't you have the feeling of like absolutely rooting for that kid yes you so want them to do well you so want yes. them to go out in the world and succeed and, and like yes. that feeling like we need these kids to yes. be healthy and strong like mm. we absolutely need them on every level <laughs> yes you know um and I mean, I feel like that applies to other people too. And yes, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of immersed in the world of midlife. So I apply it there, but I think it applies to any gender and any age, mm -hmm. you know, that we can offer these things. Yeah. So beautiful. Um, so do you want to describe more detail about your actual class that you're offering? Cause it's, uh, it's coming up 
really soon, right after this uh, symposium is running. Um, yeah, yeah, and thank you so much, um, Martha. It was just has been wonderful to have this conversation with you, and I so appreciate you, you know, including the link in the description for this class. It starts um, started on June twenty second, so it's starting really soon, and uh, it goes for six weeks. We meet. Um, and we just have 90 minute meetings where we do a ceremonial circle on like really interesting topics. Um, and it's gonna be a small group um, so that each woman is like, you know, your presence as a person there is really important. You know, it's not like, a, it's not a class where you hide in the back. It's not a class where you're gonna listen to a lecture and take notes. It's like, you know, you know we are co-creating this class together. Um, and if you think, okay, I'm not wise enough to do that, just please drop that idea. <laughs> you know, you are a human being with a long line of incredible ancestors and, you know, you have it all within you. And uh, so it's six weeks of that. And then there's also near the beginning, there's a, a Saturday uh, three hour medicine walk workshop. And I've led different medicine walks where it's just a, it's a, a, a very simple ceremony for asking nature to reveal to you um, answers to your questions. So you do it in a ceremonial way and you pose your question and you go out and allow um, nature to speak to you through metaphors. And then we come back together in a circle and, and share. So it's, you know, we meet at the beginning on Zoom, all these classes are on Zoom, but we meet in the beginning on Zoom in this medicine walk workshop and then you you go out and have your experience outside in nature and then come back and we reconvene mm. and and tell our stories and um you know it's just that can be an incredible feeling and I, I think it's so important to be you know for for us to understand our wisdom and who we are as human beings is to understand like our relationship with nature you know we, a lot of us can say we love nature but we also need to be able to receive and feel the love coming from nature to us. Nature really loves us, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and rest in that sense of being held by nature. Mm -hmm. So there's that workshop there. And then in our last class, we're gonna, um, there is an e-course that's included. It's called um, Jumpstart Your Midlife Miracle. And um, part of that is writing your midlife manifesto. It's a series of uh, intentions for your life forward. Uh, and you go through a series of exercises and then create this midlife manifesto. And then part of that will be incorporated into the very last class where we co-create a ceremony that is a rite of passage ceremony. And now maybe you think, okay, when I do a rite of passage, I want my friends and family to be there. I want my own community. So this could be a blueprint for then taking it out and doing it in your community with your friends and family present, you know, people, who you've known for a long time recognizing you. I think that's really valid. Or it could be a standalone as a rite of passage there. So I'm super excited about it. I think it's gonna be extraordinary and I think it's just gonna be a wonderful thing to do in the summer. Sounds amazing. Can you just say a little bit more about the Midlife Manifesto? I'm curious about that. Yeah, so I have a, a workbook that's a series of exercises and I think this Midlife Manifesto is uh, something where it's in, it helps you clarify your values, what you stand for. Um, and, um, you know, it's like framing what you want in life, framing who you are in life in this very positive way. And um, I've done it in different ways. Like, for example, I always felt like uh, so acutely the, the broken upness of our culture, of our society. And so I put in my midlife manifesto. Um, I see evidence of a healthy village all around me. Oh. And, um, and you say the midlife manifesto, you sing it, you create art about it. You can, you know, play with it, you know, just incorporate it into your life. Um, I think I had it on a mirror and I would just would say it regularly. And just like that practice of seeing evidence of a healthy village or a healthy culture around me made me go, oh, there it is. I'm seeing someone helping them, another person with their groceries. There it is. Oh, someone's coming over. Uh, we're having a potluck. There it is. You know, so rather than seeing everything as a huge mess, like it helped me see where things are in, in 
the natural human healthy tendencies were still evident. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, any other last thought that you feel like you haven't touched on that you want to add or do you feel complete? <laughs> Yeah, I just I'm feel, really looking forward to um, holding space for a group of you know soulful women who just really want to listen to other women, women who really want to hear what how other people answer poignant questions mm. um, and to take them in. I'm really looking forward to creating a space where people can honor and respect each other's words, and you know have this speaking circle as a meditation, you know, uh, holding a space where people aren't struggling to perform or to prove themselves at all, but just really relaxing into our natural um, energy and experiencing the, that I love the shimmering vibration feeling of a ceremony where you realize that, you know, the divine is with us, the divine is observing us, the divine is supporting us. And you know our words are offerings, and I, I feel like I'm really looking forward to being in that space with a group of women over a six week period, and I just know this is going to be um, pleasurable, enjoyable, fun, uh, thought provoking. I know it's going to change me. I know it's going to change everyone in there. I, I, I think it's going to be just um, a really beautiful experience, and you know. I just am really feel so welcoming to the soul sisters that are, are coming, stepping into the circle. Wonderful. And I'm assuming that you're open to people of any age. I mean, I'm like, in other words, I'm guessing, I, I know a lot of people coming to this symposium are beyond the 63 year age, right? So I'm assuming if people are in their 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever, yeah. you're, you'd be welcoming of yeah, I frame it as midlife because that's where I am. Mm -hmm. I feel like that elders who are in their 70s and 80s, and I've had elders in their 80s in my circles, and oh my goodness, I just feel like, oh, here's an example of how we can all honor an elder. Yeah. We can, you know, the, the beautiful feeling of honoring someone who's older than us. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It's so important to feel that in our hearts because that allows us to feel it for ourselves. So, yes. Um, I feel like, you know, there's a pretty wide age span that can attend. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and the links for all of contacting you are with this video, but do you want to name anything, your website or any particular way you would like people to be in contact with you? <clears throat> sure. My, my website is mybodywisdom.net and my email is anasuya, A-N-A-S-U-Y-A, at mybodywisdom.net. And um, yeah, I'm welcoming any, um, anybody who wants to reach out to me. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you. Wonderful. I highly recommend your integrity, your heart, your wisdom, who you are on a soul level, because I've, I've witnessed it and, it's, you know, I don't say that lightly. So thank you so much. Thank Anastasia. you so much. And thank you so much, Martha, for putting together this amazing symposium. I just, mm -hmm. uh, just um, you know, loving the, the energy of it and so happy so many people are, are attending and just mm -hmm. what a wonderful circle you have here. Yeah, I, I'm in awe. <laughs> Again, that shimmering divine presence thing is very present with all of this. So I can feel it. I really feel it. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs>